Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. And welcome to God's house. Uh, welcome especially to, to those also who are tuning in uh, on our live stream today. Let us know if the uh, sound is not good or if there's uh, anything with the broadcast that we can improve. We have two Sundays left in the church here. And we're in the final season called the end times season. Last week we talked about the signs of the end of the world. And uh, today we look at the final fulfillment and the promises that God gives to this broken world as we especially look at the Old Testament lesson in our, our sermon today. So the service is printed out for you this morning. The uh, parts are clearly marked where uh, we're going to have uh, some liturgy sung to you. We're going to have some hymn verses sung to you and everything. So uh, you, can, you can look for those in the bulletin as they come up and meditate on, on those words. God be with us as uh, we put all else outside and away for a while to meditate on his, his word. especially during these end times. We thank you that you have told us about the end and the signs that are to come, and yet we thank you that you have given us the assurance of our salvation through our Savior Jesus, who will safely bring us through them. This morning, as we come before you, we also come as sinners. We give thanks that you have sent our, your Son, our Savior, for our salvation. We come before you in a sinful condition, with sinful acts, sinful motives. We have sinned by what we have thought and said and done. Hear our confession, Lord God. God, our Heavenly Father, has been merciful to you and has given his only Son to be the atoning sacrifice for your sins. And therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
We pray. You are worthy, O Christ our King, to receive honor and glory and praise, because you were slain, and with your blood you purchased us for God. From every nation, language, people, and nation, and tribe, you have called us into your kingdom and made us priests to serve you, our God and Father. Help us to live as these royal priests and as your witnesses throughout our lives. We pray this in your holy name, for you reign with the Father and the Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. We'll now hear our scripture readings. Our scripture readings have to do with the fulfillment of the kingdom of God as he gathers his nation, his holy Christian church, to himself in Jerusalem the Golden. We read from Ezekiel chapter 37, which will serve as the basis for our sermon message today. The word of the Lord came to me. Son of man, take a stick of wood and write on it, belonging to Judah and the Israelites associated with him. Then take another stick of wood and write on it, belonging to Joseph, that is Ephraim, and all the Israelites associated with him. Join them together into one stick so that they will become one in your hand. When your people ask you, won't you tell us what you mean by this? Say to them, this is what the sovereign Lord says. I am going to take the stick of Joseph, which is in Ephraim's hand, and of the Israelite tribes associated with him, and join it to Judah's stick. I will make them into a single stick of wood, and they will become one in my hand. Hold before their eyes the sticks you have written on and say to them, This is what the Sovereign Lord says. I will take the Israelites out of the nations where they have gone. I will gather them from all around and bring them back into their own land. I will make them one nation in the land on the mountains of Israel. There will be one king over them, and they will never again be two nations or divided into two kingdoms. They will no longer defile themselves with their idols and vile images or with any of their offenses, for I will save them from all their sinful backsliding, and I will cleanse them. They will be my people, and I will be their God. My servant David will be king over them, and they will have all have one shepherd. They will follow my laws and be careful to keep my decrees. They will live in the land I gave to my servant Jacob, the land where your ancestors lived. They and their children and their children's children will live there forever. And my David, my servant, will be their prince forever. I will make a covenant of peace with them. It will be an everlasting covenant. I will establish them and increase their numbers. I will put my sanctuary among them forever. My dwelling place will be with them. I will be their God and they will be my people. Then the nations will know that I, the Lord, make Israel holy when my sanctuary is among them forever. This is the word of the Lord. Thessalonians 4 in the New Testament where Paul talks about our eternal life. Brothers and sisters, we do not want you to be uninformed about those who sleep in death so that you do not grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope. For we believe that Jesus died and rose again, and so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. According to the Lord's word, we tell you, that we who are still alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. 
After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. This also is the word of the Lord. There at my Savior's side, there is my hope. I shall be glorified. from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 25, beginning at verse 1, where we hear the familiar parable, perhaps, of the maidens that are waiting for the bridegroom, and we're encouraged to wait expectantly for the end. At that time, the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish, and five were wise. The foolish ones took their lamps, but did not take any oil with them. The wise ones, however, took oil in jars along with their lamps. The bridegroom was a long time in coming, and they all became drowsy and fell asleep. At midnight, the cry rang out, Here's the bridegroom! Come out to meet him! Then all the virgins woke up and trimmed their lamps. The foolish ones said to the wise, Give us some of your oil! Our lamps are going out! No, they replied. There may not be enough for both us and you. Instead, go to those who sell oil and buy some for yourselves. But while they were on their way to buy the oil, the bridegroom arrived. The virgins who were at the banquet, and the door was shut. Later the others also opened the door for us. But he replied, Truly I tell you, I don't know you. Therefore keep watch, because you do not know the day or the hour. This is the gospel of the Lord. And blessed are those who hear the word of God and obey it. Please be seated as we're going to listen to the hymn, There is a Higher Throne. Uh, this is a, a hymn that we've sung in, in church during the end times before. And uh, we'll hear it today from the artist that actually wrote and uh, recorded this. Also on our live stream, due to the fact that uh, this is copyrighted music, we're going to have to, uh, we cannot post this and record this, so we're going to mute our, our microphone during this song and then turn it back on after it's over.
This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Amen. In the name of our coming Savior, as we hear his word in the end times, dear brothers and sisters in Christ. Do you like magic tricks? There are a lot of these TV talent shows on nowadays, and there's a lot of contestants that come on that show, and they, they do their thing, and they want to see if the judges are going to send them on to the next round and the next place, and they do their best, and there are singers, there are people who play instruments, there are people who do acrobatic acts and dangerous things, there are people who do human tricks that you never would have thought of, and then there's magicians. Magicians. You know, I think people perk up when a magician comes out. Whenever someone says, okay, I'm gonna do a trick for you today, I'm gonna do a little magic trick. I, I think everyone perks up and sits up in their seat and they look and they're gonna see, I'm gonna see, I'm gonna see how he does this. I'm gonna see if you, I can figure this out. Is he gonna make my card reappear? Is he going to, going to levitate? Is something going to dis- Tricks uh, maybe a person did for you, or maybe one that was on a broadcast, and you said, I know, I know how they did that. And maybe there's some that you still say to yourself, I have no idea how that person did that. In our reading for today, we might be left with the same thought. The Lord is going to come to his people at a very desperate time in Ezekiel chapter 37, and he's going to speak to them, and he's going to say, I tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to do this, and I'm going to do this, and I'm going to do this. And it seemed impossible. It seemed like someone would need to be a magician to be able to pull these things off. I think at the end of our reading today, we're going to be dazzled and amazed at what God has said and what God will do. We're going to look in Ezekiel 37 to see a trick better than any magic trick that you could ever imagine. As we do that, let's bow our heads and pray today. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. As we go into this reading for today, we can think of a magician who creates a problem that needs to be fixed. You're probably familiar with that. Maybe the magician says, I'm going to take your card, I'm going to cut it all up, and I'm going to put it all over here. Or maybe the magician takes a bunch of coins and scatters them all over the room so that he can magically put them back in the box or the, or the bucket. There's a problem that usually needs to be solved. There's a problem in Ezekiel 37. And it's a big problem, but this one is not of the magician's making. This one is of God's people's making. When Ezekiel served in his ministry, it was a time of doom and gloom and depression. Ezekiel didn't even serve in the promised land. Do you know where he served? Babylon, hundreds of miles away from the Holy Land. And he served about 600 BC, long after the glory days of King David and Solomon, far, far from home. Hundreds of miles away from home in a place that they never would have chosen to live. And Jerusalem had been destroyed. The temple had been pillaged. People had died in the attack. And most of the remaining people had been let off as prisoners to go hundreds of miles away to Babylon. It was a time of gloom and depression. Maybe some of you who've read in your Bibles and the Psalms lately remember that one psalm, By the rivers of Babylon... There we sat, we hung our harps on the trees, and we wept. That was the time of Ezekiel. So what exactly had happened that would make them be hundreds of miles away from their homeland? Well, God had given and given. He had given to Abraham. He had said, you're my man, and I'm going to make you a great nation. And I'm Moses, then God brought them out of Egypt from that land of slavery, brought them through to the promised land. And under Joshua, he had re-given it to them. They had conquered the land. They had taken it over. It was now their land. And all they were doing was waiting for the Messiah 
waiting for the Savior to come that God had promised through Abraham and even before. And then they blew it. They blew it badly. They blew it especially after the time of King David and his son Solomon. After King Solomon reigned, his son was supposed to take the throne. His son Rehoboam was supposed to rule the nation again. But Rehoboam made some bad choices and he said some rash things. So people didn't want to follow him. And the nation was divided over which ruler they should have. Can you imagine that? So two tribes followed Rehoboam in the south. And ten tribes decided to follow magnetic Jeroboam <laughs> who was going to rule up in the north. And there was a divided kingdom. There was the kingdom of the north called Israel, and the kingdom of the south called Judah. And after the time of Solomon, up till the exile, it was going to be that way. The nation was divided, the ten tribes, against the two tribes. And it was a tragedy. You know, we, we think of countries that's happened to recently. Some of you might remember that Germany was split into East Germany and West Germany. What was the dream down through decades for, for those people? One day, one day we'll be reunited again. And even today, North Korea, South Korea has bitter politics that are going on. But what, what do people still dream about? One day, one day maybe, this nation will be one again. Well, after the divided kingdom came, they had bad kings, really bad kings. Kings that lived immoral lives, kings that introduced idolatry to the people. They followed other gods, they strayed from God's ways, they led the people astray. You probably remember one of them named Ahab and his wickeder wife Jezebel. Just one example for centuries. And the people suffered. They suffered under the judgment of God through droughts and judgments and enemies because of the idolatry that was in the land. Yes, they had done detestable things, God says. And he sent prophet after prophet, and he wanted to give again and give again and call them to repentance. And he had patience with them. He said, you're unclean. This is sin. This is rebellion. And he sent message after message. But, you know, it seems they just wanted something better. At least they thought. They wanted something different. The grass seemed greener on the other side of the fence to them. And they did not want the good things of God, and they did not want to submit to the governance of God either. Well, to make a long story short, they really ran out. And so that northern kingdom in the green on the map, God had them carried off by Assyria in 722 B.C., had them carried off into the nations of the world. It was on for a while yet, but in 586 B.C., Nebuchadnezzar from Babylon came, he besieged Jerusalem, he sacked the city, he burned it, he took the prisoners and took them to Babylon. And God's people went into exile. That's the first point today that we have to note. This is a tragic tale and malady that needs to be fixed. So what does God say? What will God do here in Ezekiel? You know, a magician, after he has created the malady... He describes what he's going to do. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take this, I'm going to get this, I'm going to make this appear, and, and I'm going to do it right before your very eyes. He, he calls his shot, in a sense. Well, God here calls his shot. And he has Ezekiel take these two sticks and hold them up in front of the people. And on one of the sticks, he writes down Ephraim. That, that was the, the probably the leading tribe of the north. Ephraim, who is also associated with Joseph. Ephraim was a son of Joseph. And on the other stick, he writes Judah. Benjamin and Judah had been the southern tribes. And God says, hold them in your hand before the people. And maybe Ezekiel just held them up together. Maybe he tied them together pretty tightly. I read one commentator who said they thought maybe God did a little miracle magic himself and made them into one stick to get the attention of the people so that they would ask questions about this. But regardless, the object lesson is pretty clear. We read before that God said, I will gather my people once again. I will gather them from the nations that they have gone to. I will gather them from all around. An amazing, impossible 
feet. I will make them into one nation again. One nation that is united. Boy, that would be a compelling thing, a joyful thing to look forward to. I will give them one king, and that king will be David. David will rule over them. Those glory days are going to be back. The good is yet to come. Also, they will live in the land that I gave them. They will live in a promised land that God had intended to give them all along. Now, that's an important promise. The land was something that was repeated over and over and over to, to those patriarchs and also to God's Old Testament people. The land, this will be your land. You'll have a home, and it will not be a foreign place, a strange place for you to live in. And they will be purified. They will not sin. They will not have idols. They will not do detestable, vile things and rebellious things against me. I will live among them. My sanctuary will be there, my dwelling place. Maybe some of you remember reading about the tabernacle in the Old Testament. Do you remember that tent worship site that Moses was to construct? And it would be a smaller version of the, the temple that would come later. But when Moses built that tabernacle, that tent and the courtyard and everything in the Old Testament in the wilderness, and they dedicated it to the glory and worship of God, on dedication day, in a spectacular sight, God descended with his glory, a burning cloud, and he went and he dwelled in that worship tent. A visible way God's people could say, whoa, God is with us. That will be repeated one day. And it will be forever. Your children will be there. Your children's children will be there. It will be there to never again be messed up. But it will be an eternal place for you in that land. With one king as a united nation who has been gathered from all the nations of the world forever and purified. There's only one problem. The problem is it hasn't happened yet. This has not occurred. You know, as you read that fulfillment, you might have wondered that already. The ten tribes gathered again? Did you know that those are termed the lost tribes of Israel? How come? They, they were gone and disappeared. They have never been found. They were lost forever. Those people who followed the magnetic king, the one who is not from Solomon's line. And David? David had been dead now for 400 years. David is going to reappear and rule over them? And a perfect people, undefiled, not sinning anymore? This, this is going to happen in our world's time and history? Also the land? What about the land? I, I suppose maybe some think the, the land could be theirs again, the physical land of Canaan. But with all the people creating all kinds of controversy, that is a hotbed area of the world that has truly been contested and messed up. Will that ever be a united land again? And forever? How will this happen forever? In time? In this world's history? When will this be fulfilled? It's obvious standing where we are in history to see that these are future promises yet to be fulfilled. Because God fulfills all his promises and he fulfills them in Old Testament terms, you could say. Old Testament terms of prophecies that will be fulfilled forever. When will this happen? When will people be perfected and live with God as his saints to sin no more? Well, you know, here's where we have to inject ourselves into the story. Do you need perfected? Do you know this story? Are you familiar with this account, with the way it goes? You know, God has given and given and given to you. He's given you health and strength. He has given and given and given. And the Thanksgiving week, a lot of people like to list their blessings on that, that special day. And your list might be pretty long. And yet, what have we done? Many days, we have wanted something better. We have wanted something different. We have wanted to follow a temptation or a goal that truly was not one that led us closer to mercy. 
And we wanted it, and we pursued it, and we followed it, and many days, even in our obstinacy, we did not want to submit to God's governance and rule over us. We have had our idols. We have had our detestable things. We have been unclean. This, this is an old, old story of humanity that goes back even to our first parents who wanted something better than God had given and given and given. And this in your life has led to gloomy days and depression and sadness when perhaps it has dawned on you how far you have strayed from your father's house. But what has God done? Well, it's, it's all God's action that is happening here. And just like Ezekiel had those two sticks, well, who is going to join those? Now, the people, not Ezekiel himself, he's just a representative. He talks about what God will do, and God is going to purify. To do that, he's got to bring one of those tribes back. The tribe of Judah had the promise of the Savior, and God had to bring them back after two generations so that Jesus Christ would be born. Jesus Christ had to be born to cleanse his people and to cleanse you and me. Jesus had to be born and live a life for you, and he had to be declared unclean, and he had to be exiled from his people, and he had to be crucified so that your sin could be paid for. And through his exile and rejection and death, your sin has indeed been taken away. You have forgiveness. You have a place in heaven. You're made a saint through Jesus Christ. You can be perfected, and you are a saint living every day now. Just as Jesus said in John 10, the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Well, what about gathering? You know, the gathering from the world and the nations has been occurring for centuries now. In fact, you, down through time, have been gathered as well, at some time and at some place. It's interesting that Jesus said in John 10, I have other sheep that are not of this sheep pen. I must bring them also. Jesus saw the entrance of, of his believers and even the Gentiles that were to come in the times after him. Even you who were to come after him and be gathered. And not only that, but if we look into the book of Revelation that describes the culmination of this all, it talks about people from all kinds of nations. There it says, I looked... After that, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, tribe, people, and language, the throne and before the Lamb. They were wearing white robes and holding palm branches in their hands, and they cried out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to the Lamb. The ultimate fulfillment of this is in the Holy Christian Church, which is going to be one nation under God and have one king. Oh yes, what about the king? Who is this king? Who is this David? You know, the Messiah was the fulfillment of the line of David. And it's interesting that even when the angel appeared to the Virgin Mary and said, you're going to have a special son, the angel Gabriel said, you will conceive and give birth to a son and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. Does this sound familiar? The lamb at the center of the throne will be their king. And God's presence will be with them. He will live with them. He will be their God. Just as he says in Revelation 21, I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. And he shall reign forever and ever and ever, King of kings and Lord of lords. King of kings and Lord of lords. You know how the end of the story goes. God will fulfill these promises, and we will be amazed, and all people will acknowledge it one day. And this is better than any magic trick that has ever taken place. You know, finally today, there, there is a phrase that maybe you're familiar with in our country, one nation under God. One nation under God. As I think about that, is that true? I think there are some people in our country who think it's true. I think there are some people in our country who wish it were true. 
And I know there are people in our country who don't want it to be true, who oppose it, have their own beliefs, and go their own way. I don't think we will ever be one nation under God. But when I think of that phrase, I think of what we hear today in Ezekiel 37. One nation truly under God. This is the real way that this will happen. And one day, God will bring it about just as he promised. And you and I will be there in the culmination of God's kingdom at the heavenly wedding banquet. So therefore, may we pray that God would keep us faithful and true to his promises and to the faith all our lives as he gathers us and brings us from the nations of the world into his heavenly kingdom forever. Amen. Now may the peace that surpasses all human understanding keep your hearts and minds in the true faith to life everlasting. Amen. As the bulletin says, uh, we gather our thank offerings normally at this time. And once again, we have a plate on the altar, and there's also one by the door if uh, you have an offering to leave at God's house today. Therefore, we'll continue with our prayers. We offer two special prayers today. First of all, we uh, give thanks for our veterans as uh, we celebrated Veterans Day this past week. And also, Linda Tran's sister, Michelle, passed away on Friday, and so we pray for her family. O Lord of eternity and King of saints, all the heavens adore you. Saints and angels sing before you. And today we join them to praise your majesty. You clothe us with garments of splendor. You cleanse and purify us. You bless us with your grace and mercy in this life and in eternal glory forever. What undeserved love you show us. Encourage us by your gracious promises. Forgive our failures to live as you desire. Lift us from gloom and from guilt. Strengthen the faith of all who are weak and wandering. Lord, your saints will triumph forever in the new heavens and the new earth. One nation truly under God with the Lamb at the center of the throne. And the sound of weeping and crying will be heard no more. We anticipate with joy an eternity of perfect fellowship with you. Give us strength until that day when we will share fully in the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Also, Lord of the nations, governor of this world, we thank you that on this Veterans Day week that we have this glorious land that you have given us. While nations of the world over, over have little freedom at all, we have priceless freedoms that we take for granted. Freedoms of thought, of speech, of press, freedom from fear and from want, and freedom to worship. Speed the day when these freedoms will be extended to all men everywhere. And Lord, we thank you for those who have fought for our freedom, who have served in our country, who have been in our armed forces. We pray that you would give them healing from injuries of their bodies. Also be with them as they might struggle with things of their mind. Keep them in your love and protection. Also, Lord, we pray that you would be with those who serve now to give whatever help is needed to carry out their duties. Be with them in their lonely hours. Keep them from sin. Spare them from service on the field of battle and protect them in the discharge of their many assignments, bringing them safely home again to their homes and their families. We pray this according to your good and your gracious will. And Lord God, we pray that you would be with the family of Linda Tran as they have had their sister Michelle taken from them in death. We ask that you would give them the strength that they need in this time of grief and comfort them with the precious assurance of your love for them in Christ. And may this death remind all of us how quickly our lives here on earth come to an end. Lead us to use the time you have given to grow in our knowledge of you and your word. Amen. And I will now pray the Lord's Prayer for us today. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. We'll continue with the service of the sacrament today, and uh, the liturgical parts will be sung for us this morning. hearts. We 
Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Praise to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In love, he has blessed us with every spiritual blessing. He protects and preserves his church in every age and gives us confidence to lift up our heads and watch for Jesus with joy. Now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ. To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be praise and thanks and honor.